And looks like Dave Olson's number three, and he says, with all due respect, you and James O'Keefe, peace be upon him, had it uh, had it flat wrong on our NRA segment today. You, the new media, and Project Veritas aren't the new Goliaths. You are, to borrow a phrase from blogfather Glenn Reynolds himself, an army of Davids. Thank you, Dave, uh, for that self-centered reference to your first name, which I'm sure drove the question in the first place, and you should be very, very ashamed of yourself. Um, James O'Keefe was talking about fighting Goliath uh, on um, on the Hot Mike show today. Hot Mike couldn't be here today because there's a... Um, uh, what is it? It's a, it's a the people who run the salon, uh, the the hairstylist, uh, manicurist, and and tanning salon owners are are on strike, and um, I mean uh, employees are on strike, and Hot Mike is out working the picket lines, so he'll be back tomorrow. Um, but uh, he said, O'Keefe said that you know we're we're fighting Goliaths, and he said, but we, on some level, we become Goliath. And what he meant by that. Is um, and I appreciate the sentiment, by the way, Dave. I I, I know the the spirit in which that thing is um, is is written. Um, but he said that you know that, that that what he's doing is the new Goliath. I agree. I don't think that's quite appropriate. He's the sharp rock, right? I mean, he's a sharp rock in a sling. But the fact is um, that time is on our side in this one. In so many other places, it's not. But in this one, it is. Um, it's hard to talk about this without rehashing all of this stuff, but, but you know, we are at an extremely unique point in history, and I don't mean just in the history of civilization or anything like that. You know, I know the, that the Greeks have been here and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Egyptians and all the rest, but this is different because we are on the cusp of two different ages. You know, it's agricultural age 7,000 years ago and something like 300 years ago, the industrial era began, and 50, 60 years ago, the information age began. So we are still in a, we still have one foot in each world, and because of that, we have difficulty seeing where things are going. Um, so in other words, certainly legacy media like CNN, terrestrial-based television network, once was the absolute weapon of choice because there were very few TV networks and back in fact we go back a little further than CNN you know ABC News NBC News and CBS News that's it everything everything everybody in the new in the country came from those three places and and there were for a while there almost all of it was from Walter Cronkite one man who was an internationalist by the way and, and uh, one world order guy who wanted America to basically become a postal address but if, so so CNN and the rest of them still have that kind of residual power left over from an industrial era economy where everything is centralized and everything is vertical, where three networks basically captured every single eyeball in America every single day and every night. Um, and th things are just not like that anymore. Even looking at little things like, um, like films, for example, as opposed to big cultural trends. I was walking past this... Uh, theater uh, right near the gym where I go for a walk before I get in there and do my puny working out. Um, and I, I walked past these movies, and it wasn't exactly an art house, but it was a smaller kind of theater. So there were you know, a couple of films, or Guardians of the Galaxy, but there were also a lot of films that you'd never seen or heard before. And I, and I realized, you know, I don't know how you, it's not even I don't know how you get a movie made today in terms of making its money back. But I don't even know if it matters anymore. Um, it's not going to matter for much longer. Uh, what I mean by that is, in order to, in order for a movie to have any kind of real meaning to be worth the, the fact that they cost millions of dollars, you've got to connect to an audience. You've got to connect to people in a way that they understand and, and respond to emotionally. And in order to do that, your audience has to have some kind of homogeneity. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, what I mean by that is, if you're going to make a movie about uh, just about anything, you 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 work under the assumption that your audience is going to get all the references that you that you make. That the audience that what you consider to be good qualities for the protagonist, they do as well, and and all the rest of this stuff. And I've I've come to realize that that these days are over, that our, our um, culture is 
becoming very fractured. And I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. It's probably both. It worries me a little bit, but it's supposed to worry me. It's, it's really new, and you've got to either surf it or, or drown under it. So what I'm getting at is when you had three networks, look, we, people of a certain age, we have a, we have a common language, um, a common cultural language. And if you grew up in the 60s and 70s, as I did, then, then you, you speak that language. And probably true through the 90s and maybe even into the first decade of the, of the 21st century. And what I mean by that is we all watched Gilligan's Island. We all know what Gilligan's Island is. We all know what the Brady Bunch is. We know, we know what it is. We know what Hee Haw is. We, we just, all of us know, we know what Friends is and, and Cheers and all the rest because huge, huge numbers of us sat around every night and shared this experience. And one of the experiences that we shared was listening to the, uh, the evening news at 6 o'clock. Whereas uh, Evan Sayet says the people that um, don't do things report on the people that do things to other people that were busy doing things when the news people weren't doing anything. So, so everything is getting fractured. And, and fractured isn't, it, it was fractured, now it's shattered. It, we go from three stations to maybe 20 or 30 on a cable box, and now there's hundreds and more. I haven't watched television. I haven't watched television as television. I'm not going to say, oh, I don't have a TV set. I, I haven't watched television in many, many, many years. What I do now is I watch, um, I primarily watch two things. I watch, well, three. I watch um, Apple TV for movies that I want to get, but I'm not watching many of those anymore. I watch... Uh, things like YouTube because user generated content really interests me. I think there's a lot of, there's hundred million choices and you can, you know what you're looking for. You can find things that, that are really interesting to you. I found all kinds of weird things, you know, just really strange and bizarre things that just interest me. And then the final thing I do is I spend some time uh, when I'm actually watching TV on Hulu because Hulu is basically a giant box where all of our memories are and all of our shared um, culture is. Hulu is where you go if you want to see the original Star Trek episodes and it's where you can go to see, you know, all the stuff you grew up on, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and all the rest of this. And that language connects all of us. Um, and that doesn't exist anymore. The, the millennials that are growing up now have a few references that are the same they might like the same singers they may you know be taylor swift fans or so on and they may like um uh, uh, what's the guy's name pupi doll or whatever the guy's the number one youtube guy who's got you know 100 million subscribers something like that so th so they touch each other and they and they can you know they they all know who lady gaga is for example or whoever whoever else rihanna but what they don't have is they don't have an entire lifetime spent getting the same culture from the same sources and the same people. And that really does bind us together, believe it or not. Um, I remember when I wrote my second essay for Eject, 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 uh, I opened it with, um, what's that called? I don't remember, culture maybe? I don't remember. In any event, I opened it with a story that I'd heard many times. And uh, the story was that um, a guy was walking uh, down the Champs-Élysées in Paris and um, just taking in the sights of Paris and kind of, you know, pupi, PewDiePie, thank you, Matt. Um, taking in the sights and uh, and up ahead he saw a group of people, like a like a reasonably sized crowd of people. And he couldn't see what they were surrounding, but there was a grump bunch of people in a circle surrounding something. And as he got closer, what he found was that, that um, the, the people were circling and surrounding a guy with a guitar. And the guy with the guitar was singing the ballad of um, Jed Clampett. He was singing the theme song for the Beverly Hillbillies. And the people that stopped were American tourists because, come and listen to the story about a man named Jed is home. And some people had tears in their eyes. And he went and he did Gilligan's Island theme and he did Brady Bunch and, and he did all of them. And, and these American tourists are just, some of them are weeping not out of pride so much, just out of familiarity and relief, I guess, something. You know. uh, Natasha uh, found a, a Russian goods store yesterday, and she texted me from there with, you know, seven exclamation points. And, and when I got home, she had all kinds of little things, little biscuits, kind of a certain brand of coffee, a kind of sausage, that kind of thing. And they were all Russian products. And, um, 
And she was on fire happy because this was home to her. It, it'd be like being, you know, like being in some foreign country and then all of a sudden you, you, know, you get to a McDonald's or you see a Snickers bar or something or a Coke or whatever. You've been drinking goat's milk, whatever. It takes you right back home because it's part of the shared culture. So all of this to say that the whole idea of Goliaths is going away. Um, CNN... Uh, is doomed, not as a result of these um, uh, videos, but rather as a result of the kind of enormous political forces that make them invent the news. And so here, you know, here we are uh, with, instead of three networks, we've got, you know, I don't know, 300 maybe, three, 300 people at least, doing some kind of regular political commentary with, with some significant followers and thousands of well, millions of people post, posting their political opinions. And, and you know, here's how uh, you operate this um, washing machine and, and all that stuff. And, um, and so since everything's so much fractured and shattered, you end up with a smaller group of people for an audience. And this is what got me thinking about the movie thing. You know, it's like this may be the future. You know, 100,000 YouTube followers, which is about what I've got, 130,000 Facebook friends, this may, be in, this may be in the future pretty much as good as it, as it gets. Um, we're not there yet, but it seems like we're heading that way. And the, and the last thing I'll say about this was um, I had a chance to meet somebody I like very much, admire very much. I was going to an event, and, and I was walking through LAX, and I saw Mike Rowe over there, and I know a lot of people um, responded to the picture I took. I got 20,000 likes from it within 24 hours. I've had enormous respect for Mike, uh, not just not just for the message, which I think is terrific, the whole you don't need to go to college kind of message, but just because his, his delivery is so flawlessly accessible. I, I don't know how you could not like Mike Rowe. Um, and, and Mike said something that's really just really nails what I've been talking about. I was telling him how much I loved his... Um, the way I heard it, stories, which is which is him in his house, with a laptop open, using the what I assume is the embedded camera in a notebook because it's kind of looking up at him, and and he's usually not shaven. He's got his cup of coffee. He sits down and just starts talking and telling a story, just like he's talking to you. And one of these things that he did recently um, got two million views, which is a pretty decent number. It's not an insane number, but it's a, it's a decent number. Um, and Mike said, you know, if I did an episode of Dirty Jobs and that episode got 100,000 views, the network would send me flowers. You know, they'd, they'd, be, they'd be buying me drinks because it was a really good number for, uh, for um, Dirty Jobs. And, uh, and I, I just got 20 times that, and I just, I just sit there and talk to people. And one of the things that um, I'm sure I've talked about before is it's, it's actually quite, it, it is, you know, I'd love to tell you it isn't, but it is. It's depressing to me. Um, but not so depressing that I don't face the reality of it. It's depressing to me that the more you produce something nowadays, the worse it will do. That all the effort I put into graphics and music and all the rest of it and firewall and getting the picture exactly right and all the rest of it is probably not only a waste of time but is in fact actually probably hurting. Um, I've heard from many, many, many people in social media who base professionals in social media who basically say, if you really want to connect to people and if you really want to, you know, grow the brand and stuff, the best thing you could do is essentially a selfie of it. Just, just turn on the camera, and just talk. I was really very. I mean, I wasn't angry about it. I was just disappointed, I guess is a better word, you know, because I like, I like the details. I like putting the work into it because I come from a second wave industrial era entertainment background, and I'm entering rapidly into a third wave information era based uh, enter entertainment network. And you, you, you know, evolve or die, right? You, you either adapt or you die. Um, and that's when you kind of realize you know, that maybe even though it's disappointing on some level, that what's, what, so what's, what's, it, what's behind that? I, I believe it to be 100% true, so what's driving it? If Mike Rowe can sit at home, turn on his webcam, and speak for four minutes, 
um, and tell a story and get 20, 30 times the views he got with uh, Dirty Jobs, uh, you know, with, with an entire network behind it and hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars an episode and so on and so on and so on. What is that really saying? Why is it happening? And I think what, what I've discovered is, is that people would rather have the accessibility and the intimacy rather than the polish. And the more you polish something, the further away it gets from uh, accessibility, which is why seven or eight of you are um, strat uh, Stratosphere Lounge fans. I mean, this is the worst produced show on the internet. And that's kind of the point. It, it's charming for you sometimes. I know some people make fun about it. Uh, I, I It drives me out of my mind. But the fact that me just sitting here talking into this camera right here is completely unproduced. It has a feel where everything is authentic, and that's because it is authentic. There, this is authentic. I'm not. I'm not presenting something. I haven't written something out. I haven't edited. It. You know, I don't know what I'm going to say next. As you probably know well by now, if you've been watching the show for a while, now, nobody knows where it's going to go. I don't know where it's going to go, and the fact that I don't know where it's going to go is kind of the charm of it for me. So, it's not really unreasonable for people to say, no, the more you produce the show, the um, the less we like it. And we had a little taste of that when we start, try to do the Stratosphere Lounge in front of the Stratosphere Lounge backdrop. I was looking forward to that so much. You know, you get a new camera angle, you get a two-camera shot kind of thing going, a couple chairs, and pretty much universally people said, we don't like it as much. Why? Well, we just don't feel like you're talking to, to me like you used to. And I do feel like I'm talking to you. It's an odd thing to explain, really. It's not a... It's not... It's not, I'm not blowing sunshine at you or, 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 or anything when I tell you that I really do feel like I'm speaking to one person, although I don't know much about who that person is. It does not feel like a group speak for me. This is just me talking on a, this is be exactly what I sound like in a, you know, in a bar after a couple beers. You can't shut me up then either. So, um, yeah, so Rich says, we feel like you're seeing the real Bill Whittle. Well, that's because you are seeing the real Bill Whittle. And, um... And the guy who does firewalls is obviously me, but it's not as me as this is. When I do a firewall, I just shot two of them. Um, the language is more polished. It's generally, hopefully, more on targets, more inf more solid information at my fingertips, and I've got you know visuals and all the rest of the things that I think help. But in actuality, they don't help. They really just kind of probably hurt it. Uh, and we have the Gorn Captain in the background. Thanks, Woody Fool. Um, so... This is, I think, where the future is going. Uh, Dave and, and an army of Davids is what is what Glenn Reynolds wrote about 10 years ago. He basically called it, you know, well before it happened. He he started my career and many others um, over at Instapundit, and, uh, and, and I think he's right. Instead of these gigantic, massive structures being beaten by other massive structures, they're going to be beaten by these tiny, tiny little things. Um, you know, like the Stratosphere Lounge, you know, you can't, can't imagine the idea that the Stratosphere Lounge could go up against CNN or up against, you know, CBS or something, but on a lot of levels, it's more effective, and, um, and that's good and bad, so, you know, I, I still want to do certain, uh, certain things where I get to put some production values into things, uh, taking forever on this, um, movie, we kind of get these, uh, Star Citizen assets imported into an engine that I can use. I really, really need to do a demo of that very, very much right now. Um, but the reason I'm excited about that is, as I've said before, if I can do these um, these movies inside the game, uh, not only do I reach people I wouldn't have reached before, but my tool bet, my toolbox is just so much more en enormously larger. I, get, I can I can use music and I can use dialogue and I can act and I can have antagonists and protagonists and reversals and all the stuff I can never do in, in something like a firewall or a stratosphere lounge or a right angle or something like that. You just, I just don't have the tools. I mean, my tools are right now first person speaking and I try to make that as interesting as I can. But what I could do with the, with another, with a bigger tool set, I, I like to think I, I would amaze people with. I really genuinely do. Everybody says, you know, I hear it every day, don't don't give up doing this. You're so good at it. It's a very, very kind thing to say, actually. Um, 
And and my my response is, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. But you ain't seen nothing yet, you know. There's so much. There's so much that I could do with um, with the bigger toolbox. And and I want to. I'm never going to give up doing the firewalls and stuff. It's never going to go away. It, it never is. There's always going to be something that's going to that's going to piss me off enough so that I just get on fire and I just pound it out and and launch something that I, that I really like and really feels good about. So that's not ever going to go away. But without trying to sound uh, at all sorry for myself because I love this life that I, I that I live thanks to you guys and I just I just love it. I love my I love my studio. I love my my home. I love. Uh, I love the person I'm with, and, and I've never been this happy. But, you know, it's it's been getting harder and harder for me to do these firewalls and more and more resistance to them. And I just thought, you know, maybe you're getting lazy or whatever. It's it's, it's like... I, I it, The honest truth of it is I'm just bored with it. I've done 300 maybe big videos like firewalls or afterburners, and no less, no less than five or six thousand total video segments. And first person talking, I feel like after doing it for eight years, I feel like I've pretty much done it. And it's part of the artistic uh, personality, I guess, to want to be doing something new. You don't want to get off of something you're very good at, but sometimes you have to. Um, sometimes you, you have to. You just have to go off and, and stop doing what you're very, very good at because it's essentially automatic and go learn how to do something else and, and have the fun and the experience of being getting, of getting better at it. Um, that's, you know, that's tough. And so somebody who I do not like or respect very much at all, personally, I, Woody Allen, I can still nevertheless completely sympathize with him when I couldn't before. I just didn't, I didn't understand it. I, I now completely understand his reaction when people come up to him and say, well, we liked your earlier, funnier stuff much better. Okay. But that's, but that's, he's done it. He's done it. He doesn't have to prove it. He doesn't want to be there anymore, and he's moved off somewhere else. Now, I happen to think, despite his personal feelings, he's a terrific filmmaker, really, really, really good. And he's doing what he wants to do. And when it comes right down to it, when you're dealing with something like this that's somewhat creative, if you don't like doing what you're doing, you're not going to do it very well, which is why these things are getting harder and harder. It's not like I don't like doing them. It's just that I've done them so much. How many times can I say this stuff? How many times can I can I bring it around? Now, a few more times, apparently. That's why I went on this gigantic uh, interview live show uh, theme since January. You know, we did um, Bill Wood Alive. We tried that. We tried, uh, we're doing After Hours and so on. I got the... the uh, NRA show, it's different. It's unscripted, so I like it better. But uh, wh what I'm obsessing on is is um, doing these in-game movies. I'm just can't, I'm simply obsessing. And by the way, I, I know people don't want to talk about it much. If you send in a Star Citizen uh, email, I have not responded to them yet. I haven't read most of them. I'm still trying to get to the place where I can and answer them. But this is what I obsess about. This is what makes me happy. What I, what I do with my spare time is I look for ways to see if I can put together a costume that looks realistic enough for, you know, under a thousand dollars. And I, and I look at logos for the, you know, for the, for the various branches of the government that doesn't exist. And I, and I'm just, I just, and I'm practicing on the space combat. I'm practicing with our friend Matt Lloyd. L last night, um, Matt and I, uh, got into, uh, we got into pretty much identical, um, spacecraft and, I showed him the basics of formation flying, and I've never seen anybody fly formation in a video game ever. And he said, you know, we get the basics of this down, then we can get Foghorn in here, and he'll teach us the, the right language. And I said, you bet he will. Um, so these things are exciting to me. And um, unfortunately, right now, I, I, my income is based on doing the other stuff. So, I, I, again, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm not unhappy. I, I just am straining at the leash because I know there is more I can do. I can be more effective than I am now. I can I can deliver messages in a way that people wouldn't even know they're getting messages. It would go to people who we've never reached before, who we need to reach, and that's what I really want to do. So I'm trying to find a way to do it. Um, the nice thing about the the uh, doing the video game movies is. Um, 
because uh, it's, it's almost precisely halfway between where I am and where I want to be. I'm doing political commentary. I want to be doing feature films and doing political films in a little puppet theater is pretty much the halfway point. And uh, Arcterran wants to know what my favorite ship is in Star Citizen. It's the um, Saber by a mile, unless you're fighting somebody in an actual battle that I'll go with a Hornet with a big gun. Um, anyway, uh, that's pretty much it. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to, to being able to, to not just do different, not just a different kind of content. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing some acting. And the reason I know that this is good is because the stories are writing themselves. That this, the, the, the firewalls are just constantly get, just get on it, just do it, get it done, get it done. And, and, and this, on the other hand, is like awesome. And then this, and oh, I could tell this, and, and it's just, I talked to Zoe. Um, Alfonso Rachel came in here, and we talked about it for a couple hours. And it's just, I'm just on fire for it. Because I want to do, I want to do scenes with Zoe. I want to, I want to act in in a scene with Alfonso Rachel, and I want to tell stories that way. And I know I've mentioned it many times before, but the the the, the perfect example of what I want to do is look. I, I do a video like Number One with the bullet or the guns thing for the virtual presidency, and I'm making the case for gun ownership and against gun control. And I do it pretty much every day on the Stinchfield Show and and frequently on Bill Whittle's Hot Mic and all of this. And it's me talking about it. It's all a head argument. It's all, it's all you know, trying to be persuasive and rational and reasonable. And all, it's all of that stuff. But what I really want to do is I want to have um, two characters who are sympathetic see a sign on the outside of a bar that says this is a no, this is a gun-free zone, weapons prohibited, and I want them to walk in there and see you know, so the people just being gunned down. There's seven or eight bodies on the ground there. It's just a massacre. And I want, I want to look at the sign and I want to say, well, I guess they didn't read the sign. Because that is much more powerful than anything else I'm doing. It, it just completely destroys it. It just utterly destroys it. I guess I didn't read the sign. Of course I didn't read the sign. They're murderers. They're pirates. They're whatever they are. They're, they're, they're gangsters. Of course they didn't read the sign. The idea that the sign would save them is ridiculous. And I told Zoe this story. I told him this exact story. I said, I just want to turn to it and say, you know, um, uh, maybe they didn't read the sign. And Zoe said, well, maybe they did read the sign. What? So maybe they did read the sign and they knew they weren't going to get any trouble here. This was going to be a pushover. And that's when I said, okay, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. So um, I've got the whole, uh, you know, basic arc played out. Um, I want to be, uh, I want to bring in, I've done some flight instruction and I like doing it and I think I'm pretty good at it. I certainly like doing it. So I want to have, um, the fundamental storyline be right now the the game is limited to one planet and we're, we're waiting daily for the outline that'll let us land on three of the moons and basically fly around all over the place but right now it's just this one solar system and it's out in the middle of nowhere and so i thought well you got to work with what you got to work with i want to be i want to play a guy who's a, a colonel who's been in for a long time and i basically want to be john boyd is who i want to be i want to be a guy who's got revolutionary ideas about um, tactics and very critical of the of the uh, military even though he's in the military and I want to be a guy who who the character I want the character to have been a guy who's been banished to the butt end of the universe and given the worst equipment there is and that's his punishment they can't really push him out but they can make life so miserable uh, for him that he doesn't want to do it anymore and he doesn't want to do it anymore and he gets a whole new um, gets a whole new class of, uh, of young pilots and all the young pilots all thought they were going to be off of carriers and right in the front line with, you know, top gear. And instead these, um, these young pilots find themselves in the butt end of the universe with junk and nothing to do but these boring patrols. And this, you know, this guy who used to be a gunfighter kind of thing. I always like that that angle on the westerns. You know, he used to be a gunfighter and now he doesn't anymore. It's what this guy used to be. Character I want to play was he was a really good combat pilot, and now he's an excellent combat teacher, and he's teaching them the heresies that he was basically exiled for. Um, and that's interesting to me because in many cases of thinking this through, I realized. I can have this character giving flight instruction 
And at the same time, he's giving personal advice, but it doesn't sound like personal advice. Um, I think it's just tremendous, just tremendous. Little, little things, you know, that I picked up when I was a, a student pilot, little tiny things. Um, and one of my favorites is, is one of the smallest. I, I take a great deal of pride in, in precision taxiing. That may not sound like a big deal to you, and it isn't probably, but it's a big deal to me. I didn't even think about it. And I would be taxiing around all over the place, and I'd be, you know, I don't know, 10 feet to the right of the center line. And my flight instructor just turned to me, and he just said, he said, you're consistently right of the center line. I said, yeah, sorry about that. And he said, it's just as easy to taxi down the center line as it is to taxi down a line 10 feet to the right of the center line. And that went into me like a, like a, like a lightning bolt. It's like, well, of course. That's a, what a beautiful thing to say. It's just as easy to do it right as, as it is to do it wrong. So do it right. And I do. And to me, that says professionalism. And part of it is... I believe, I genuinely believe this is true. Somebody might be able to back it up. But I genuinely believe that if I taxi like a professional and that front wheel is in the center of the center line all the time, that over a period of time, the people in the tower see this and they know that they're dealing with somebody that they can count on. It's somebody who flies with some precision and, and, and respect for it and who wants to be good at it, wants to be, wants to be perfect at it. And, um, and that interests me. And, uh, and the language interests me. They're going to be introducing air traffic control in the game, but I can tell you already what it's going to sound like. It's going to sound like, uh, you know, the Freelancer, uh, clear to land, pad eight, something like that. And I know what civilian air, uh, air traffic control sounds like, and I can write that very easily. And I thought, oh, let me just look at some of the military stuff. And you can find this on YouTube, which is why I love YouTube. You can find on YouTube, it's about an hour and 20 minutes of an intercept, just people on the coast in San Diego picking up the radio transmissions, you know, just, just with receivers, it's not like it's, you know, encrypted or anything. They're picking up the radio transmissions of um, carrier operations that are occurring 20 or 30 miles off the coast or so on. So basically, you're hearing, um, you're hearing what, the, what the pilots hear. And it took me at least 15 minutes to, de to decode what was going on because while... Um, Civilian air traffic control is a language that maybe has, I don't know, 50 words in it, maybe less, maybe fewer. Um, this was a, a language with five words in it, you know. Somebody would call in, you know, it's a 301, you know, um, and then and some other information that I could tell you, you say uh, 6.5, which has got to be his fuel state, I would think 6,500 pounds left. And, um, and then the woman who was the air traffic controller, and she was terrific, by the way, um, is, is, is responding to call as Marshall and... Um, and you could tell if somebody had a low fuel state, they give them. She would give them a different category approach, and she would basically there's a there's a term in there called the button. I don't remember really well, but then she would say, um, you know, expect three four or something like that. Expect three six. And I thought, what she's doing is she's she's getting these these uh, hornets lined up so that the interval is appropriate and and adequate for them to land get off the wire and, and bring in the next guys without having to wave anybody around. So when she says expect 3-6, it's expect 36 minutes past the hour. And somebody else is expected at 32 minutes past the hour and, and so on. And I'm listening to, um, I am listening to, to this language and I just loved it. And I want to include that because no one's doing this in the game world. No one is doing this in the game world. And no one's flying formation in the game world either. And we went real low over this space station where everybody kind of starts in this limited version of the game as this is, is now Matt and I. We went in there real low, real fast, and in a very, very tight formation. And I've never, if I'd been on the ground, I would have been blown away because nobody does that. And there are people out there who want to take things seriously. They want to, they want to learn to do things the right way. And one of the ways you can recruit those people is by, is by using language and procedures that you don't have to explain to people. They don't understand them, but they do understand that this is how the professionals do it. And those are the people I want to really reach. Those are the people I want to recruit. I want to get people, I want to get young people who, who see something being done the right way and are completely intrigued by it and are ready to do the work and the discipline to get it done right. And those people, I think, are the kind of people we can use as uh, warriors in this culture war. So I'm going to have them doing touch and goes and slamming onto, you know, a pad out there and then back off again. And, uh, and 
you know, all of this kind of instructional stuff. You know, we'll see. But in any event, um, uh, Vipers, uh, Foghorn's already offered to, to give me the, the lingo. Uh, Foghorn, I have to tell you, I feel very bad about not having uh, responded to you yet. But the reason I haven't is because I hold you in such high esteem. I just don't feel like I'm, I'm ready for it. I don't, and I need, I, I really want to just hang out and talk to you for two or three hours. Because, um, because this is what's going to do it. I never thought about it. I never, ever thought about it. I've done, I've done tens of thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours of, um, of uh, computer-based flight sims. And only with this DCS did I ever see people flying in formation. And I've never seen people using actual tactics. I remember, I think I might have mentioned this last week. If I did, you're going to hear it again. I want to have a scene where I'm in this computer world, you know, and I'm going to overdub the heads probably. And this guy's going to get up to the front of the room and these young pilots are going to be pissed off because they know this is not where the action is. They feel like they're being wasted and they're being shuttled off into the middle of nowhere. And I want this guy to, um, to, to basically start his briefing and have a picture of a guy in, a, in, in World War II, you know, khakis and say, this is the man that's going to save your life. And he lived a thousand years ago. This thing's set like a thousand years in the future. And, and he's going to say, this man's name is John Thatch. And John Thatch is going to save your life because the stuff we've got out there to now is junk. And the people we're going out against are not only better equipped than they are, with, they're better trained and they're better pilots than we are. And that's why we're getting beaten. And this thousand-year-old genius is going to save your life and probably mine as well. And here's how we're going to do it. And then just show him the thatch weave. And I, and, and I, and I saw that. After I had the thought, I saw the thatch weave, saw a couple of, of, you know, documentaries on how it worked. And it's so simple, and it's so brilliant, and it's so effective. And no one's doing it. Uh, they're doing it for real in the real world, but no one's bringing that into the, into the game world. The game world is where you reach people, primarily younger people, primarily bright younger people. These are exactly the people we need to get on our team. And losing them to socialism is a catastrophe. So... We do something with precision flying and precision language that they don't understand, but that they do understand is, in fact, what real pilots sound like if they're really, really doing it. And then you, um, and then you basically, that's your hook. Yeah, we do it for real. We do it for real because we do it for real in the real world. I'm a real world pilot. One of the guys in charge of our Air Force is an actual re retired F-16 pilot. Uh, and, and we've got our, our tactics are, are done by a guy who's an actual current Navy SEAL. And I think that's interesting and I think, um, it's going to work. So I got to keep knocking out the firewalls and, and make this transition. And, um, yeah, I would just sit, I would sit with, with a, with a mountain of work to do. Don't get me wrong. A mountain of work to do. I would sit sometimes for four hours, five hours in front of this big old monitor here and I'm on Shutterstock, and I'm just looking for logos because I want, I, what, what, what are the ground troops? What's their, what's their, uh, what's their patch going to be like? What, what are they going to look like? What, what is the, um, what is the tourism thing going to look like? What's the shipping branch going to look like? I'm just, I just can't get enough of it. I can't get enough of it, and I'm right open. So um, right now, I'm, I'm just trying to get it done. But the problem is, I cannot get the assets into a game yet. I, I don't have the tool. I don't have the, I know how to use the, pu the, the puppet theater, but I can't get one. Um, and I'm trying using freelancers, but it's a little more difficult than I thought. So, uh, yeah. By the way, by the way, um, there's a running joke I want to use in this thing. And, and, and once you realize this, it, it, you kind of have to be a computer gamer to, to, to get it. But this is a line I want to use, and I want to use it repeatedly because I think it's really funny and it's interesting. If you look at these um, levels, if you look at the space station that you start out or you look at the, you look at the bars, you look at the, the, the star ports, you look at everything, the hangars, and they're these gigantic metal prefabricated structures and they're very, very dark. And they're dark for effect. And I want my character to basically walk into one of these rooms and basically say, God damn it, we've had nuclear power for a thousand years. Why is it so dark in here? Can we turn some lights on, please? And they turn on some lights. And it's just like, yeah, why is everything so dark in here? Why? Because it looks good. But that kind of thing is, that kind of thing is the, the thing I'm, I'm really interested in doing is, is kind of breaking open that, that um, you know, that entire set of cliches and just kick it open and, 
and this is going to be a pet. It's going to be a pet peeve of this character. He's going to mention it practically every episode. It's going to, why is it so dark in here? We have we have fusion reactors. I I I, I just altered the quantum state of me and and, and forty thousand pounds of steel, and and we can't get some light bulbs in this restaurant. That kind of thing. I love it. 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 Um, so anyway, um, I'm still uh, kind of recruiting here, and what I'm waiting for is I'm waiting to do one demo. I need the I need the toolbox, and I can't get it. I've been working on it for two weeks now with a freelancer. I may need to open this up a little bit. Needless to say, if any of you out there are, are game designers or level designers in, in CryEngine or anything like that, I sure would love to hear from you. Um, but in any event, yeah, I just I just want to do that. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and it, it's going to be fun. It's just going to be a blast. And uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed. You know, this is why the Stress Free Lounge is the Stress Free Lounge. I spent hours looking at these logos, and I've spent days, days looking at a way to make a real-world costume that looks like it came out of the game because I can't really do much about the costumes in the game. And the, the hardest part was to find a helmet. And let me make sure I got this right. And I looked at some advanced motorcycle helmets, and some of these motorcycle helmets look really, really cool, but they still a little, little jutty at the, at the jaw, and the visor's a little bit small. In Star Citizen, the visor covers the entire face. And then I found um, two things. Where I'll see if I can find it. It's worth the wait. Yeah, okay, so I'll just drop this in. So this is, um, this is just a... Uh, a motorcycle helmet, one of many, and by no means the most um, uh, the most uh, futuristic one in terms of what I'm looking for. But this is like a that's a, here comes a motorcycle helmet. You just go out and buy it. And um, here's another one, I think. Yep. And uh, let me get the sound on this. So I'm looking at, at helmets, and I'm looking at motorcycle helmets, and I, first of all, I tried to buy a prop space helmet. I couldn't find one. And then I thought, okay, maybe I'll go with, like, a, a motorcycle helmet, you know, something like this. Uh, and something like this is a good deal closer to what's actually in the game because it's got a big visor. And I had just about given up, and then I started looking for other things, and I saw some paintball uh, face masks that looked exactly right, and then I, I saw some welding uh, bubble face masks that I thought were ter hang on, it's not ter terrific. Yeah, this is a um, is a gas mask for or or a, a respirator I should say. This is a respirator for um, painting, and I think it might also provide some actual gas mask protection here. Uh, but this is what I'm looking for. Uh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. The problem with this, I buy, I buy it right now. I would just buy it. But the problem with this is this is only a mask. doesn't cover the back of your head. How do you mate this to, a, to, a, um, to an actual helmet? The, the, the visor is perfect. It's exactly what I want. And the thing I found that was probably the best compromise, although I'll probably end up bashing something together, is, um, is something that I just, I just given up. I thought, okay, I've looked at every single motorcycle helmet on the Internet. There's nothing left for me to see. And, and you're just going to have to make do with one of these. And then I found something else. I found snowmobile helmets. They were even cooler. Hang on. So this is called... Um, I'll just bring this last picture. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. I saw this just as I was about to give up. And I thought, <laughs> darling, where have you been all my life? Um, I'll bring you two pictures here. Here's one. Oops. And I'll bring one more. And then I'll tell you what it is. Um, so, uh, as I said, I was just about to give up. And then I saw this, which I'm just going to fix the audio for. Hang on there. Okay. Um, yeah, look at this. That's really cool. I've got another angle here somewhere. Uh, here we go, and this will be the last of them.
same helmet. I thought, my God, um, you know, somebody's gone and built the exact prop that I want. And you know what this is? I, I can't get a prop guy to get to build it for me, hopefully, Rich, but right now I, I got to work with something a little quicker than that. That is a skydiving helmet. And it's very, very close. You look at the way the suits are built, they're made out of something that looks like rubber. A wetsuit is very close. So I'm ready to go, man. I am ready to go. Um, and we'll see. But in any event, uh, you can expect a new firewall, hopefully tomorrow, certainly by the next day, and then another one probably 10 days after that. I've got two of them in the can, um, and that's enough to get me going, I guess. So it's 712, and I'm sorry about having to do a short show, but it was a short show or none at all. i got to get back to the, to the um, grind of uh, you know, getting another one of these things out here. Uh, hopefully it'll be worth it. And um, I guess that really will pretty much do it. Uh, again, if you want to be part of this, if you want to send a, an email to, to info at billwhittle.com with the Star Citizen header, I will do it. And I deeply apologize for not having responded to anybody yet and for, I don't even know why, other than to say I'm not, I just don't feel like I'm quite ready, but I will be very soon. Uh, so then we can talk about it, you know, off camera and not bore everybody else with the, with the rest of it. So that'll do it for episode number 158 of the Stratosphere Lounge, uh, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com, as always, and by our loyal and trustworthy fans, which would be uh, you guys, not just fans, friends. So um, thank you again uh, for everything. Thank you for this incredible life. I was wheeling in the, uh, the, the recycle, you know, the garbage pan, uh, containers and the recycle thing. And I, you know, it was a couple, a week ago or so. And I just wheeling these things into my house that I'm renting. And I just thought, this is, this is as good as it gets, you know. It's a beautiful little house in a nice neighborhood. And we have this beautiful woman inside. And I've got this, and she's a, you know, a professional and she's just, always interesting to me and 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 I've got my own job and I've got this car and I've got an airplane it's just a miracle is what it is uh, so let's see if we can work hard to make sure that these um, progressive bastards don't take all this fun stuff away all right we'll see